who are having a discussion about enrolling in a university course. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Registrar's Office, this is Pam. Yes, hello. I'm calling about enrolling to study at the university. This is the right number? Yes, this is Mitchford University Admissions. What would you like to know? Well, basically I need to know what I have to do to be enrolled as a student. You see, I'm currently studying education at another school I've just finished my first year, but I'm not really enjoying it. I think I'm more interested in accounting. My dad teaches maths, so I thought it might be a good choice. Well, better than business anyway. Okay, okay. Have you received a registration pack? No. How can I get one of those? Well, you've got to have one to register. You can enroll at the university at any time after you receive a registration pack. These are usually available from September for first-year and transferring students and from November for returning students. On the basis of the information contained in the registration pack, you should attempt to make a firm choice about which courses to study before completing your form. I see. So I've only got a month to get my registration pack in. Can you send me one? Sure. If you are close to a high school, the registration pack and university prospectus are available from the careers advisor. Would that be helpful? Well, the closest school's too far away and I haven't got a car. Are there any other ways you can send it to me? Well, for prospective students who have already left school, the registration pack and prospectus are available from the university information line. But that might not be of help for you? No, not really. I'll tell you what, why don't you give me your contact details and I'll send a pack out to you. At least that would be a start. Okay, sounds good. Right. Firstly, what's your name? Richard Dreyfus. That's D-R-E-Y-F-U-S. Your address there, Richard? Unit 12, 15 Sportsman Avenue. That's S-P-O-R-T-S-M-A-N, Mermaid Beach. Four double five four. And your telephone? Yes, I won't give you my home. Mobile's best. Uh, 0414. Hang on a minute. I don't call myself usually. Uh, I think it's 0414 Yes, that's it. Okay. Now, do you have email? Yes, I do. It's Dreyfus, my last name, at Igo. That's I G O. Dot com. All lowercase letters, of course. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 8 to 10. Okay, that looks fine. Now, do you have any questions for me? Yes, I've got a friend who is interested in studying at the university. I'm not sure what would be best, uh, the best way for him to register. Can you give me some suggestions? Sure, there are three ways to register. Option one is telephone registration. Before you telephone, fill out the registration form included in your pack. This will ensure you have all the information that you require. The number is in your registration packet. Don't forget to hold on to a copy of your registration form for future reference. Yep, yeah, okay. Option two is registration by post. All you have to do there is complete the relevant sections of the registration form and post the completed form together with all documentation required in the envelope provided. All right. The third way is to simply come in. Visit the Student Information Center in the Information Services Building and your friend will receive personal assistance on how to complete his forms. Thanks very much. You've been most helpful. You're welcome. Good luck with your future studies.
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. First, now you have some part two. time to look at questions part 11 two. to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Good afternoon. Hello. How can I help you? I'd like to make a transfer, please. You want to transfer some money? That's fine. Let me just bring up some details. Right. Here we are. Can you tell me your name, please? It's Alice Del Tour. OK. And your date of birth? 20th of February, 1982. Right, and for security, can I have the first letter of your password? It's V. And the fifth letter? That's F. Fine. Now, where do you want to make the transfer to and from? I'd like to send money from my current account abroad. Which country are you sending it to? To China. My boyfriend is on holiday there, and he's run out of money. Oh dear. China, OK. Now, there are several ways to do this. We can do it by credit card, by electronic transfer, by cheque or by banker's draft. Um, I'm not sure. What's the best way? Well, that all depends. The simplest way is by cheque, really. I just write the cheque and send it. Yes, but it can be very slow and take a long time for the money to clear. Between three to four weeks. How soon do you need the money to get there? I'd like it to get there in the next couple of weeks. So really, sending a cheque is going to be too slow. Yes, I think so. Let's look at electronic transfer then. This usually takes between two and five working days. That's two to five days. Working or business days. If you send it on Friday, it will get there the following Friday at the latest. I see. That's much better. Yes, but we do charge a fee for this. We charge a flat fee of £21, and on top of that, the receiving bank may charge a fee, and an agent may also charge you for transferring the money between banks. So, how much is it altogether? We can't give you an exact amount. You need to check it with the receiving bank and any agents that they use. I see. Also, you can send it in sterling or dollars from here, but there will be an additional fee depending on the exchange rate when you convert it into renminbi. So, there will be another charge too? I'm afraid so. Does it make any difference if I send it in dollars or sterling? It could make a difference according to which currency has the best exchange rate. The other difference is this. If you send dollars, the amount goes through the US clearing system. We send the money to our branch in London. They then send it to our branch in New York, and the New York branch sends it to the bank in China. It goes all around the world, then. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. What about if I send sterling? In that case, we send it to our branch in London. From there, it may go directly to China, unless the bank in China has an agent in London, in which case we transfer it to the London agent and they send the money on to China. So how do I proceed with the transfer? 
Okay, first we'll need some details about the beneficiary from you. The who? The beneficiary, the person receiving the money. Okay, what do you need to know? We'll need the full name of the beneficiary and their account number. Okay. You need to tell us the name of the bank in China and the address of the branch. We also need the bank's sort code and the SWIFT number. What's a SWIFT number? Basically, it's an interbank code. It helps banks identify each other through a unique code number. Okay, and that's spelt S W I F T Swift. And the final thing we need is the reason for sending the money. You need a reason from me? I just told you my boyfriend's run out of money. Well, we don't need a reason. The receiving government needs to know why the money is entering the country, and we have to be able to tell them. Okay, so from me you need. The bank's name, the address of the branch, the sort code, and SWIFT number. The beneficiary's name and account number, and a reason for sending the payment. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so I'll check these out and come back to you with them, so we can go ahead with the transfer. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Here an interview conducted by an interviewer special with a scientist, Peter Piot, who discovered Ebola, a dangerous disease. Both of them are conversing about the disease and its origin. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Professor Pite, as a young scientist in Antwerp, you were part of the team that discovered the Ebola virus in 1976. Can you tell how did it happen? I still remember. Some day in September, a pilot from Sabina Airlines brought us a shiny blue thermos and a letter from a doctor in Kinshasa in what was then Zara in the thermos. He wrote there was a blood sample from a Belgian nun who had recently fallen ill from a mysterious sickness in Yambuku, a remote village in the northern part of the country. He asked us to test the sample for yellow fever. These days, Ebola may only be researched in high-security laboratories. How did you protect yourself back then? We had no idea how dangerous the virus that we were dealing with was. And there were no high-security labs in Belgium back then. We just wore our white lab coats and protective gloves. When we opened the thermos, the ice inside had largely melted and one of the veils had broken. Blood and glass shards were floating in ice water. We fished the other intact test tube out of the slop and began examining the blood for pathogens using the methods that were standard at the time. But the yellow fever virus apparently had nothing to do with the nun's illness. No, and the test for Lassa fever and typhoid fever were also negative. What then could be? Our hopes were dependent on being able to isolate the virus from the sample. To do so, we injected it into mice and other lab animals. At first, nothing happened for several days. We thought that perhaps the pathogen had been damaged from insufficient refrigeration in the thermos. But then, one animal after the next begun to die. 
we began to realize that the sample contained something quite deadly. But you continued. Other samples from the nun who had just died arrived from Kinshasa when we were just about able to begin examining the virus under the electron microscope. The World Health Organization entrusted us to send all of our samples to a high security lab in England. But my boss at the time wanted to bring our work to a conclusion no matter what. He grabbed a vial containing virus material to examine it, but his hand was shaking and he dropped it on a colleague's foot. The vial shattered. <laughs> my only thought was, oh shit! We immediately disinfected everything. And luckily, our colleague was wearing thick leather shoes. Nothing happened to any of us. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. We were finally able to create an image of the virus using the electron microscope. Yes, and our first thought was, what the hell is that? The virus that we'd spent so much time searching for was a very big, long and worm-like. It had no similarities with yellow fever. Rather, it looked like the extremely dangerous Marburg virus, which, like Ebola, causes a hemorrhagic fever. In the 1960s, the virus killed several laboratory workers in Marburg, Germany. Were you afraid at that point? I knew almost nothing about the Marburg virus at the time. When I tell my students about it today, they think I must be from the Stone Age, but I actually had to go to the library and look it up in the Atlas of Biology. It was the American Center for Disease Control which determined a short time later that it wasn't the Marburg virus, but a related, unknown virus. Hundreds of people had already succumbed to the virus in Yambuku and the area around it. You were also the one who gave the virus its name. Why Ebola? On that day, our team sat together till late into the night. We had a couple of drinks discussing the question. We definitely didn't want to name the new pathogen Yambuku virus because that would have stigmatized the place forever. There was a map hanging on the wall and our American team leader suggested looking at the nearest river and giving the virus its name. It was the Ebola River. So by around three or four in the morning, we had found a name. But the map was small and inaccurate. We only learned later that the nearest river was actually a different one. But Ebola is a nice name, isn't it? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 4 You are going to hear a talk on Anne Bonny, a female pirate. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Anne Bonny was one of the two most famous female pirates. She sailed on the crew of Calico Jack Rackham. 
Anne was romantically involved with Calico Jack, but she could be counted as nonetheless as fearless as any other pirate. She was born in County Cork, daughter of an attorney and his maid. The lawyer left Ireland in disgrace, but found fortune in the Carolinas. There, he amassed a fortune and bought a large plantation. A ne'er do well pirate sailor named James Bonney married Anne in an attempt to steal the plantation, but Anne's father instead disowned her. Bonney then took Anne to the Bahamas, where he turned informer to Governor Woods Rogers, turning in any sailor he didn't like as a pirate for a handsome reward. Anne quickly grew to dislike her spineless husband and quickly caught the eye of one Calico Jack Rackham, a pirate of some renown. Governor Rogers had recently passed an amnesty for pirates, which left Bonnie out of work. The admiration between Anne and Calico was mutual. Calico Jack was a handsome man who knew how to spend money as well as steal it. Anne was a well endowed lass with a fiery spirit and a temper that matched that of any man. In any event, Calico offered to buy Anne from Bonnie, but Bonnie instead took the matter up with Governor Rogers. Who said that Anne was to be flogged and returned to her true husband? That night, Calico and Anne slipped out in the harbour, stole a sloop, and began a life of piracy together. Now look at questions thirty-six to forty. Thirty-six to forty. Anne fought in men's clothing, was an expert with pistol and cutlass, and considered as dangerous as any male pirate. She was fearless in battle, and often was a member of any boarding party. In October of 1720, retribution was close at hand. The governor of Jamaica, hearing of Calico's presence, sent an armed sloop to intervene and capture the captain and crew. Calico's ship Revenge was caught by surprise, and much to Anne's dismay, the pirates fought like cowards and were taken far too easily. Anne and Mary Reed were also captured, but upon capture, confessed their sex and pleaded to be tried separately after they gave birth. Both women were pregnant at the time. Both received separate trials from the men, but were still sentenced to hang. Mary Reed escaped the hangman by dying from fever while in jail. Anne, however, received several stays of execution before mysteriously vanishing from official records. It is believed that her father, who had contacts in the island, forgave his daughter for her acts and ransomed her back to the Carolinas, where she assumed a new name and a new life. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.